A man walks down a dark road at midnight, a guitar case in his hand and trouble in his heart. At a crossroads, he meets a stranger, a mysterious man who makes him an offer. He takes the guitar, tunes it up, plays a couple of chords. He hands it back, a glint in his eye. All you have to do is accept my terms, and what you desire is yours, but there is a price. What would you do in his position? Would you take that stranger's offer? Or would you let it pass you by and fade in obscurity, mediocrity? Tempting, right? It's one of the oldest legends in guitar music history. It's time to dive into the mysterious and misunderstood life of Robert Johnson, the king of the Delta blues. But before you do, if you're not subscribed already, please do consider hitting that button. It really helps me out. At first, the music repelled me. It was so intense, and there was no attempt being made by this man to sugarcoat what he was trying to say or play. I realized that on some level, I had found the master, and that following this man's example would be my life's work, said Eric Clapton. The facts about Robert Johnson's short life are few and shrouded in myth and contradiction. Born in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, possibly on May 8, 1911, his life was beset by tragedy, losing his first wife, Virginia Travis, and their child in childbirth when he was just 17. His second wife, Coletta Craft, died in 1933. He spent much of his life as a traveling musician on the road, using different names for different towns, drinking and womanizing to cope with his grief. He died at just 27, the exact circumstances still unknown. It's theorized that he was poisoned with nathaline, made from dissolved mothballs and put into a bottle of whiskey by a jealous husband, Robert's roving eye sealing his fate. When we went out there that Saturday night, uh, Robert was sitting back in the corner with his guitar in his arm. Two things you like, you're crazy about whiskey and women. <laughs> Robert had, was going with that man's wife. His waitress, the woman was waiting, selling hamburgers and fish and whiskey. She gave Robert whiskey, but she didn't know what she was giving him. And Robert got, tried to play, he couldn't play, and, Everybody found out that he was sick. They put him across the bed in another, another apartment over there. So Robert died on, on a Wednesday. Even the site of his grave is disputed, with three different markers erected at various church cemeteries outside Greenwood. There are also only three verified photographs of him, the third only coming to light in the last 10 years, discovered on eBay, mislabeled as a portrait of a young B.B. King. When Robert was young, he was described as amateurish, lacking in talent. Sun House, another Delta bluesman recalled, Folks, they come and say, why don't you go out and make that boy put that thing down? He running us crazy. Finally, he left. He run off from his mother and father and went over in Arkansas, someplace or other. So he was gone about six, eight months. So then he come back. And when he come back, me and Willie Brown was playing out to him and he walked in. I said, no, nah, don't come back with that, Robert. I said, you know that people don't, don't want to hear that racket. He said, definitely let them say what they want. I said, I want you to see what I learned. After a brief spell on the road, Johnson returned, having mastered his instrument. He was suddenly good, really good. It was all down to the tuition of another blues guitarist, Isaiah Ike Zimmerman, whose intensive lessons transformed Robert's playing. According to one of Zimmerman's daughters, interviewed by the blues researcher Bruce Conforth, the pair met in a venue and... Robert Johnson asked my daddy to teach him how to play guitar, and my daddy taught him. He lived there with my daddy. He stayed a long time because he was staying to learn how to play the guitar. It seemed like to me he just took him for his family, because for a long time I thought he was related, and they was going at that guitar like some. I told my son I can remember hearing that music because it sounded just so good, just like they were competing. He was teaching him then. Staying between one and two years under Ike's mentorship, the pair would practice late at night in graveyards so as to be undisturbed. When Robert was ready, he began to play solo again. Ike Zimmerman never recorded any of his own music and gave up playing entirely, becoming a Pentecostal minister before dying of a heart attack in 1967. Prior to Johnson's death in 1938, he recorded 29 songs for the American record company with the help of H.C. Speer. Speer was a record store owner from Jackson who was responsible for launching the recording careers of most of the great Mississippi blues musicians of the 20s and 30s. Without him, much of their work would have been lost to time. 
He was rewarded with a posthumous induction into the Blues Hall of Fame in 2005 in acknowledgement for his work. Johnson's complete canon of recordings includes these 29 masters, plus 13 surviving alternate takes, all recorded at two ARC sessions held in San Antonio and Dallas, Texas, in just seven months between 1936 and 1937. Most were first released on 78 RPM records in 1937. In 1938, John Hammond of Columbia Records invited Johnson to perform a concert at Carnegie Hall that he was producing to showcase African-American music entitled From Spirituals to Swing, only to receive news that he had died. A record player was wheeled out in front of a live audience and Johnson's songs were played to them instead. Now I know I'm no Robert Johnson and I often find myself overwhelmed by the instrument. So I asked for guidance from one of my favorite guitarists, Ariel Posen. Check out our guitar course to get re-inspired. The first 1000 people to sign up using the link below get a 50% discount, so check it out. When Samuel Charters published his 1959 book, The Country Blues, the first academic study of the genre with an accompanying soundtrack, it was Johnson's intriguing talent and mysterious life that captivated readers and caused a resurgence of interest in his work. Johnson had always deliberately played up his devilish image, writing songs like Hellhound on My Trail and Me and the Devil. The liner notes to 1961's anthology King of the Delta Blues singers helped further cement his legend. He seemed constantly trapped. He was tormented by phantoms and weird, threatening monsters. Robert Johnson appeared and disappeared in much the same fashion as a sheet of newspaper twisting and twirling down a dark and windy midnight street. High-profile musicians cited him as a major influence. Bob Dylan, who was gifted a copy of the album by John Hammond, said, When Johnson started singing, he seemed like a guy who could have sprung from the head of Zeus in full armour. I immediately differentiated between him and anyone else I had ever heard. The songs weren't customary blues songs. They were so utterly fluid. At first they went by quick, too quick to even get. They jumped all over the place in range and subject matter, short, punchy verses that resulted in some panoramic story fires of mankind blasting off the surface of the spinning piece of plastic. All right, Bob, that's probably the best quote I've ever read out. <laughs> a small and dedicated fan base of record collectors became a tidal wave, and the blues became hot property among college kids who'd never heard music like this before. The Johnson scholar Elijah Wald, in his book Escaping the Delta, wrote that Johnson was much more than the figure we know, one respected for his ability to play in a wide range of styles, from raw country slide guitar to jazz and pop licks, and for his ability to pick up guitar parts almost instantly upon hearing a song. He was just as much a player of swing, ragtime and crowd-pleasing pop hits as he was for his darker blues material. The blues historian Edward Kamara wrote that Johnson's greatest legacy was his innovative guitar technique. The execution of a driving bass beat on a plectrum instrument like the guitar instead of the piano, is Johnson's most influential accomplishment. This is the aspect of his music that most changed the Delta Blues practice and is most retained in the blues guitar tradition. It's been called the boogie bass pattern or boogie shuffle and is described as a fifth, sixth degrees of a major scale oscillation above the root chord. Bruce Conforth and Gail Dean Wardlow authors of the biography Up Jumped the Devil, described it as one of the most important riffs in blues music. Several of his songs, Sweet Home Chicago, Dust My Broom, Crossroad Blues, and Stop Breaking Down, became blues standards, further cementing his legendary status as the king of the Delta. The music historian Peter Guralnik wrote that Johnson popularised a mode, walking bass style on guitar, which would rapidly become the accepted pattern. It was used by Chuck Berry on Johnny B. Good and Roll Over Beethoven. Led Zeppelin, Clapton, Dylan, Bonnie Raitt, Jack White and Keith Richards all cite him as a major influence. The Rolling Stones, possibly more than anyone, had a role in popularising Johnson's music to a wider audience. When Keith Richards was first introduced to Johnson's music by his bandmate, Brian Jones, he asked, who is the other guy playing with him? Not realising it was Johnson playing one guitar. 
I was hearing two guitars, and it took a long time to actually realise he was doing it all by himself, said Richards, who later stated that Robert Johnson was like an orchestra all by himself. Legends aren't born, they're made. The gaps in Robert Johnson's life story made him an intriguing puzzle to be solved, and it's the hunt for the real man that has fascinated blues scholars over the years. For a fuller look on Johnson's life, I recommend the Netflix film Devil at the Crossroads, or the biography Up Jumped the Devil. Blues artists like Robert Johnson were so much more than the recordings they left behind. Their live performances were where the magic really happened. Sadly, we'll never get to see them, so the records will have to do. Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video. I love making these videos and you make them possible. Be sure to check out the description to find the discount link for my guitar course with Ariel Posen. But otherwise, I'll be seeing you here very, very soon.